Good afternoon, everyone. I want to extend a warm greeting to our incredible online audience, our esteemed panelists and moderator, our partners and co-laborers, Xavier University, Louisiana, Southern AIDS Coalition, and of course, our remarkable sponsor, Gilead Sciences. Your presence and your support are essential to the success of this event. We do not take your support for granted. Thank you. Now, as we commemorate National Black AIDS Awareness Day, our focus will intentionally center around the crucial theme of from awareness to action, assessing the state of HIV funding on National Black HIV slash AIDS Awareness Day. Now, this conversation underscores our commitment to translating awareness into tangible measures and evaluating the current status of funding dedicated to addressing HIV and AIDS within the Black community. Join us as we delve into a critical examination of the pivotal role played by funding resources in HIV testing, treatment, and access to care, both within the Southern states and nationwide. Now, our three-man panel will be providing national, state, and regional perspectives, as well as local perspectives into the issue. Our discussion today will encompass the potential repercussions of proposed and ongoing initiatives to reduce funding within the HIV sector. Thank you once again for being a part of this meaningful and imperative dialogue. Now let's engage in some meaningful discussions to help make a positive impact. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here today as we shed light on the critical issue of federal HIV funding and its impact on our communities. As a clinical associate professor and certified HIV pharmacist at Xavier University of Louisiana, an HBCU dedicated to its core mission of promoting a more just and humane society, I've witnessed firsthand the profound impact of this epidemic, particularly among Black and African Americans. Analyzing the data reveals that in 2021, Louisiana ranked third in the nation for HIV diagnosis rates. By 2022, an estimated one in six people living with HIV in Louisiana were undiagnosed, with two in three of those living with HIV being black. Shockingly, as of September 2023, 63% of newly diagnosed HIV cases occurred in black people, despite their constituting only 32% of Louisiana's total population in 2020, per the U.S. Census. In response to these alarming statistics, we have launched our campaign, Louisiana Can, because we truly believe that Louisiana can end the HIV epidemic. Through this initiative, our goal is to mobilize the community, raise awareness, advocate for action, and provide resources to individuals living with HIV or at a higher risk of acquiring it please visit www.louisianacan.org to learn more. Today's webinar is of utmost importance, especially on the eve of National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, as we navigate ongoing funding reductions that threaten to exacerbate disparities in testing, treatment, and access to care, particularly in Southern states like ours. To address these challenges effectively, it's crucial that we unite not only to raise awareness, but also to inspire action. Each of you, through your dedication to this cause, plays a pivotal role in driving change and addressing the persistent disparities. Without further ado, like all of you, I eagerly anticipate the insightful discussion ahead with our esteemed moderator and speakers, and I will now yield the floor to our amazing moderator, Dezon. Greetings and good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful and very, very excited to be here and to have you all join us for this conversation this afternoon. I'm muting my own phone, so give me a second. Of course, I don't want to do that right now. It's all right. So I want to welcome you to this conversation. I'm excited to have it. Um, I think the topic is extremely important at this point. Uh, not only in the year, but at this point in time in our experience at a time when 
at the very moment when so many advances in HIV pr prevention, HIV treatment, uh, HIV care, and HIV cure are advancing at rapid stages uh, and coming out in a lot of ways with a lot of learning, good and not so good, or not necessarily what we wanted, we're learning as much as we can about the fastest way, the best way, and the most effective and equitable way to get to the end of the HIV epidemic for our community in particular, for Black folks in the United States. But because we're trying to end an epidemic that disproportionately impacts people of African descent worldwide, what we do here, what we acknowledge here, and the work that we win here um, helps win for everyone, or at least that's what we aim for. And in this context, because of the competing priorities, because of so many things that are happening in our world, because there are so many other factions that are uh, ready to pivot away from HIV, the discomfort in having to address the ongoing, uh, uh, what do we call determinants of health inequity, some people would call them social health determinants, are leaning toward looking at other critical issues that are impacting our communities, that are affecting our populations, and also impeding our best op opportunities for optimal outcomes with our health care. The interest, the focus, and yes, to some degree, the funding and the resource intentionality with ending the HIV epidemic seems to be shrinking or seems to be dwindling. Even in the latest Funders Concerned About AIDS report that just came out at the end of 2023, looking at funding resources uh, across the United States and across the world, is that there, have, there has been a diminishing return in terms of what investments have been made from private funders, from the philanthropic space, as well as in governmental spaces because of the politics and the political implications of budgetary decisions that are made in Congress and then effectively implemented by the executive branch. We have also looked at dr drastic offers of cuts to PEPFAR, to Ryan White funding, and in some degrees to our prevention funding. What's happening with the ending the HIV epidemic resources is still uh, up for question mark in terms of the sustainability of those resources to get us to our end target of 2030. So in the conversation we're going to have today, I'm really excited for the leadership that we have that's going to take us through looking at uh, some of these questions. Oh, you know, I should have done this. Make no assumptions that everybody knows me. <laughs> I'm Dazon Dixon Jallo. I'm the founder and president of Sister Love based here in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm sitting today. Uh, and I'm also the founder and president of Sister Love International in South Africa. So I have a keen interest in bridging our conversation today between what happens in terms of Black uh, HIV response in the United States and Black HIV response in the rest of the world, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, who do we have with us today? Well, let me tell you, they're going to introduce themselves. And so I want to first call on uh, my brother, my kindred, uh, sitting in one of the most fabulous places on the planet. Morris Singletary, would you just give us a quick introduction of yourself, please? Oh, my gosh. First of all, I'm so honored to be with you. You are a mentor. You are, I stand on your shoulders, and I thank you for that. But let me do what I'm supposed to do. I'm Baptist. Uh, my name is Moore Singletary, so first give me honor to God. Um, I am the executive director of the Positive to Positive Initiative, but more than that, I'm a subject matter expert on living with HIV. This year will make 18 years that I've been living with HIV. That means my HIV has grown. And so um, we need to do the grown folks stuff for grown HIV. And I'll leave it there. Or at least you can vote. Come <laughs> on, can, and shall. <laughs> There you go. Well, thank you and welcome again, Morris, to this conversation. Uh, and up next, I would love to introduce uh, Sati Neshwaya. I may have butchered that. I apologize deeply for it, Sati. I hope I'm getting close to it. I want to hear you say it um, so that we can say it appropriately with you. Uh, but please introduce yourself, Sis Sati. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I feel like I'm with royalty today. Um, I am Sadie Nachwaya. I use she, her pronouns, and my nine to five 
is a United, but I'm an advocate every day, all day. I am coming in from Texas, um, but I am a Southern girl. I'm so excited to get in the conversation and it's just going to be great. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, I'm just going to ask you again, just to say it, uh, say your last name for us just one more time because I might. Nechwaya. Nechwaya. Close enough. Thank you so very much. Well, we're going to hop into our conversation right after our next guest, our panelist introduces themselves. Will, tell us about you and welcome. How's it going, everybody? Uh, super excited to be here. Super excited to be part of this amazing panel and, and led by you, Dazon. Uh, I'm super excited. So I am Will Ramirez. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for Southern AIDS Coalition. I am um, located out of Atlanta, Georgia, temporarily right now. Yeah. Yeah, I hear yeah. that. Uh, mine is usually temporary, too, because I'm loosely loving to leave Atlanta so I can appreciate her more when I come home. So <laughs> I'm glad to have y'all here. We miss you, Mars. Uh, <laughs> so let's jump right in. Well, I'm going to start with you because there's... Um, as Director of, Pol of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Southern AIDS Coalition, which, as we know, is a national organization with a regional focus, can you talk a bit about the most significant structural barriers that Black and Brown communities in the Deep South, particularly, and even broader, because the Deep South and the Southern U.S. aren't necessarily one and the same, but talk about the Southern U.S., what we're facing, especially in terms of accessing uh, testing and treatment for HIV. Well, thank you for that question, Dazon. And, you know, I, I just want to level set. I want to start off <clears throat> from the beginning with this. You know, we have to understand that a large part of the history of the U.S. is one of discrimination and racism, and that is undeniable, right? And that history has led to, to many structural and institutional barriers, particularly in the South, particularly for Black communities. So, and this can manifest in various forms, you know, through limited access to health care, which we see the South having the highest rates of uninsured persons in the country. Texas leading with 24%, Oklahoma right behind with 20%. It also has the largest percentage of rural hospital closures in comparison to other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, we also see in the South that we have a ton of socioeconomic disparities. The South happens to have the top 10 states with the highest poverty rates in the country, mm -hmm. right? So there's many others uh, forms that are manifested that show these barriers, right, through education, housing, discrimination, et cetera, which all lead the South to being responsible for 52% of new HIV transmissions almost every year, despite only being 38% of the U.S. population. So this is a reality that we see in the South. We also see um, an example that, that was uh, shown by the CDC's PrEP uptake report that, re that was released uh, late last year that it showed that uh, PrEP uptake among, among uh, white populations was 77% of white eligible populations were taking PrEP compared to just 13% among black eligible populations, right? So this is not just about individual choices, or, you know, how health outcomes end up in the South, but it's, a deeply rooted, it's deeply rooted in structural challenges faced by black communities. You know, apart from limited, ac limited access to healthcare services or lower rates of health insurance coverage, um, we also see a lack of, of, of cultural competent healthcare providers coupled with a general historical distrust uh, towards the healthcare system in, in which, you know, coupled together make for terrible outcomes. The CDC report highlighted a need to prioritize targeted programs and policies to, to accelerate progress within these populations and this is one of the things that, that we have to, to focus on when we see that report, because many times when we see that report or when we see that report highlighted is to tout the victories of PrEP uptake from 10 years ago to now. Mm -hmm. Just always ignoring the disparities that were shown with health outcomes and PrEP uptake. So it's a critical, it's a, you know, when discussing disparities and outcomes, it's critical that efforts be made to address the, the social determinants that contribute to HIV disparities. And I think that starting from there, our conversation, I think it, it, it would really go to a place that for us to really understand where we're at. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that connecting this, the, the state 
of affairs, as you've described so beautifully and eloquently, are immediately connected to what investments look like in our community, whether it's direct investments in our community service delivery, in our public health structures and systems, or whether it's direct investments in our own communities and their capacity to develop. So thank you for raising the the real baseline of understanding that we need to have to understand where some of these gaps are coming from and where we need to go to fill them, right? So, so if I popped over um, to Sassati, in your role, looking at state policy management at AIDS United, uh, and AIDS United, a uh, long time relationship with y'all as a national organization partnering in states nationwide, what policies have you found that are most effective in overcoming these barriers? And give us, if you can, some examples of successful initiatives that have improved testing and treatment access in Black communities. So I definitely think it's a part two-part question, but I think yeah. one that we saw that has been effective with moving the needle, I'm not going to say overcoming because we're still on a journey here, but I think overcoming some barriers that are structured is one, we know that Medicaid expansion has been monumental to Black folks and just the South in general. We know that the Affordable Care Act has expanded health care coverage and Medicaid um, in so many states, providing so much access to just being able to not just actually get tested, but go straight into access to care, to getting prep uptake and treatment and prevention just in general. I think that also, you know, pushing, if we're talking about certain initiatives or certain policies that have improved testing and treatment is really this access to syringe exchange service programs has really increased. You know, to me, I'm still on the journey of trying to figure out that piece because it's so on a it's a it's an area that I'm still trying to learn, but I think that it's so innovative of what's already been done before, you know, supporting these programs to prevent, you know, more HIV transmission among, you know, folks who are injecting drugs or reducing harm or promoting safer practices. You know, I think that that certain initiative was not only monumental in overcoming barriers, but it was innovative because folks haven't been thinking outside the box. We've been so on this whole pace of making it HIV centered when there's so many other interconnected issues that are monumental to breaking down these barriers and just taking another step option of going up. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving where you're heading towards intersectionality and diversity uh, and in some instances, like in my organization, Sister Love, we often talked about how we're experiencing horizontal diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Where everybody's Black, but we have all of these different experiences that have a lot of different intersections for which HIV may have very differing implications. And so I think you're absolutely right in that. And thank you for, uh, for expressing that and sharing that. Um, but in terms of something successful, something... Um, why that just knocked your socks off to say, you know, this is really where I see it's working. Is there anything yet? I mean, it depends on what you mean by us actually just working. I think that, you know, anything about any of the epidemic, um, the EHE, that was really monumental. I think fast track prep uptake is really monumental as far as clinical uptake and getting that patient provider, um, relationship. I think it was a good start. I don't think it's a completely successful just yet, you know, but we got to start somewhere. So yeah, I think those two initiatives and really taking it a step notch is probably where we're going. That's really, really good. That's been successful. Yeah. And I might take moderator's privilege and say, at least in some areas, we can't yeah. really see that yet across the South because we yeah. haven't yet to fully implement it. But I would say that concerning Black communities and access to testing, um, and in a large way, treatment is the expansion of Medicaid, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, making HIV screening and, and prevention tools a part of the essential health benefits probably has indicated some success. Um, I, I, I want to throw that in because there's still uh, room for us to fight. Right. in the South, particularly for seeing that success happen through that particular policy mechanism. So, Morris, 
I want you to talk about your extensive, ex drawing on your extensive experience as an HIV advocate and, of course, as the executive director at Positive to Positive, P2P. How do you see the role of community-based organizations evolving to address the needs of Black folks living with HIV in the South? Thank you so much for that uh, question. I'm your contestant number three. Um, so <laughs> the way I see it is- well, I choose all y'all, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way I see this is we have to start with community-based. That's the whole thing right there. If you really come in for a community, then it's for us, by us, which know how to do with us, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're in that space, things begin to change. I remember someone asking me to come sit on a board for youth. And although I'm youthful, I'm not a youth, <laughs> by uh -huh. far, right? And so we have to be intentional with that. We got to start with community-based, right? And so the way I see community-based uh, organizations um, addressing Black, uh, Black needs living with HIV are the following things. Membership has its privileges. Mm. <laughs> and so when you're Black, you can say something to Black folks that other people can't in a way that they can't. When you're Hispanic, you can say it in a way. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It has its privileges. Cultural this, capital. Let's make a new phrase. We're going to call that cultural capital. Cultural capital, baby. And so when you got it, you got it. <laughs> and when you got it, don't know how to use it, then things start to move, right? I tell people all the time, I think I said it in the beginning, I'm Baptist. So I know how to talk to church folk. Mm. I know, I know it. Let's do it, right? Mm. Mm. This is how we begin to change the needle, right? Uh, move the needle. Like, this is how we begin to change. That's how we're going to end the epidemic. Mm -hmm. you no, know, against anybody else, our allies. And when I say our allies, that's not the same community, <laughs> right? Community, right. I'm black, I'm gay, and I'm Christian. I'm a black gay Christian. I just said two different, all different things in that same thing. And so I know how to speak to people who are like me. If you black and you male, I got you. Yeah. If you black, gay, or male, I got you. If you living with HIV, I got you. I'm not a cisgender woman. I'm not a transgender, right? And so we have to make sure that community-based organizations are community-based mm. and we can move the needle. I love that, that the representation, the leadership, the decision-making, the lived experience, all of that is what makes that community-based organization community-based doesn't have to be exclusive to that experience, but it has to be centered in that experience, right? That's so, right. <laughs> so in that regard, uh, in terms of some of these challenges, and I'm going to open this one up to the larger, all, all three of my potential dates, uh, is, and, and I sort of feel a weird way of asking this because I, I want to make an assumption that I'm probably the OG here, uh, I just realized that uh, next month will mark 40 years for me in the sexual reproductive health space. So starting when I was two months old is a bit of a interesting story. But let's talk about the historical challenges, right? That there obviously are, but let's talk about some that stand out the most for you um, that challenge black and brown advocates in the HIV movement, what we have faced and how these challenges actually influence the current advocacy strategies. Where have we been? Let's have a Sankofa moment, right? Where have we been in terms of challenging as advocates uh, some of these issues? What have those challenges been? And how does that relate to where we are today with our advocacy? Anybody can jump in. So Stop. I will first off say like, no one told me when I was an advocate that I needed to be kind to myself and prevent burnout. I think that that's something that has not talked about for black and brown advocates in the HIV movement is this work is hard. This work is tough. And there's gonna be so many spaces that you aren't really allowed or they don't let you allow that you have to bring a folding chair every single time. And so I think that like promoting mental health among advocates is something that's so important. And those challenges really have influenced like how we move about this work. We see that the older advocates, the pioneers have been doing this forever. They are tired. And so there's no direct, we have so many advocates, but not enough mentors. And so I'm a newer advocate. I've only been doing HIV work for probably about five plus years now. And so like, I'm seeing like 
it is really time for me to step up because there are folks that have been doing this forever that are waiting for me to take the lead. And so I think, yeah, something that's really been a huge challenge is like trying to create mentorship that like even the spaces that I have been a part of, it's time for someone else to take on the torch from where I were, was or where I was. And so I, yeah, those challenges have really impacted how we move on advocacy, how we stay steadfast because I don't say resilience because I think black folks have been doing that their whole life but I will say that like resilience is could be in so many different areas but I think the fact of just staying forward and keeping our feet on the ground is so important um, and how do we do that in the current climate that we're in and just folks that we're around yeah you've got a lot of amen corners happening over <laughs> the chat days with folks uh, agreeing that we need more access to intergenerational mentors. And I love the intergenerational mentors because it goes back and forth. I find myself needing to call on a whole lot of young people to understand uh, what has changed and how to incorporate uh, yeah. the new thinking into what we know has been tried and true in our work. Uh, Morris or Will, any thoughts about where we have come from in terms of challenges and where we are? I'm gonna to come to Will and then Morris. Uh, thank you. I think that, so I used to teach history uh, a few years ago uh, to middle school kids. So, you know, I always try to emphasize the historical elements of whatever conversations that we're having, right? Uh -huh. And I think that with, you know, as I mentioned earlier with, you know, American history and, and its ties to the history of, of US, you know, of discrimination and racism, it, it really influences this work as well. I think that that has been, has profoundly shaped how systemic discrimination and equality impact HIV, the HIV movement. You know, at the onset of the H, of the H, of, of HIV in the 80s, uh, it was largely seen as affecting primarily gay white, white men, right? We, we know that as a history of, of HIV in this country, which contributed to, to marginalization and neglect of impact of HIV on black communities. Hmm. That a few years later, I would say, few decades later, led to the creation of my organization, uh, the organization I'm a part of, Southern AIDS Coalition, because it was partly born out of overwhelming disparities that that Southerners were facing, especially Black Southerners in HIV. And, you know, we continue to see kind of these disparities today. Right. During these times, Black advocates uh, face many challenges and continue to do so, and which includes in, uh, a stigma within their own communities. And I think, uh, Morris kind of highlighted that a little bit, and, and I think we may be able to speak on that a little bit. Because, um, you know, Black advocates weren't only fighting against HIV, but also against all the systemic barriers that hindered an effective response and care for people living with HIV or affected by it. And not only externally outside of their communities, but also internally within. The, you know, these historical challenges, though, did lead, and, and, and Sadie mentioned this, uh, with resilience, and, and I understand the trepidation not to always mention that within Black communities, but there is growth that has come from that, right? And I think it has influenced several parts of the movement, including community-based approaches. I think that the Black community has has become an innovator in, in identifying ways to approach community with, with these kind of conversations in a way that other communities have, hasn't, right? Addressing stigma and discrimination, policy advocacy, Incl uh, inclusive research and data collections is things that we continually strive to, to, to fight for, right? And, and collaboration and coalition building, I think that black communities also lead on that front. And of course, empowerment and, and leadership development. And this is things that are ongoing, but I think from, from the resilience that was gained from the efforts of the 80s and the 90s among black communities and black ad activists, it has led to advances within the movement for black empowerment through these different uh, avenues. Mm, thank you. Absolutely. Morris, you had a thought. Yes. Um, I want to first point out that all advocates and um, activists are not HIV positive. And I say that because I need people who are living with HIV to understand that people are coming with love and you need to get it. <laughs> right? And also for those allies and advocates who are not HIV positive, for them, for y'all to realize there's a little bit of hurt that we got to get over. As people live with HIV, and we're gonna get there, right? That's my that's my job. That's a subject matter expert to talk to people and let them know that, right? So advocates and allies who are not HIV positive, I want to recognize you. That's number one. Um, number two, once an advocate, 
Always, baby. Listen, I I was in a club with a red cup in my hand, and somebody said, "You made a video about insurance. Can you help me?" Come on, baby, because you may not have that chance again. So, once an advocate, once an activist, always that will be your turn. Um, and then the last thing is for advocates. I know we want to, you know, we're coming up with ideas and we, we, we're doing things uh, to to move the needle, as we are saying here. But I want us to challenge the myths. Because sometimes we let them hang and we don't challenge them. Mm -hmm. If you got a myth, I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's let's break it on down. Like, because I want to teach you the truth. The right. Truth lasts longer. The myth yes. has history, but the truth will last longer. So I want advocates to challenge the myths. I love that. One of these days you'll see me in a conversation. I, I've been dreaming about this and I'm sure I'm going to have a series of these conversations soon just called who told you that right so we can actually have some stories from where these things come from because a lot of these things are coming from people that they trust family members cousins aunties old you know my nana and the friends in my life the friends in my life people right. who are not living with people who are living with it but have a different experience than those who than someone else who's living with it it's so nice. i think that there's a place for us to get to the root of where our stories come from but in terms of this historical thing uh and i'll move to the next question um i'm going to add mine in here just because uh, i'm an old act upper so i i i can tell you from a historical standpoint um, that, interestingly enough, a lot of the work and where we are has come because people were very angry. People were very adamant about being uh, holding the government, holding the decision makers, government and industry accountable to the fact that we're dying, right? And rapidly and fast. The thing is, is that those angry people were white people. Those angry people were predominantly white men. And I was one of those black folk who was like, y'all go to jail, we go to prison. I'm not doing that part, right? Well, today the epidemic has shifted. It is predominantly black and brown. We don't have the same level of uh, grace in this country to be angry and to hold people accountable in the same way. So I think that has dramatically changed our advocacy strategies and how it slows things down to some degree because we have to do that work inside legislatures we have to do that work in partnership with the decision makers as opposed to in uh adversarial situations with the decision makers and that i think changes the dynamics of how we make change happen so i just i wanted to throw that in because that at least is my experience and i concur with everything else that y'all have said um, because it's all real and it's a part of our lived experience. So, Will, in terms of the Southern AIDS Coalition, how do you, based on some of the challenges we talked about, how do you work to influence public policy, both at the state and federal levels, uh, that are meant to improve HIV-related outcomes in Black communities? What What do you all take on in terms of policy work? So that's it's it's heavy work. It's it but it's, you know, it's, it's work of the heart. And I think uh, SAC does a really good job in engaging with community, but it, you know, it does so primarily through, through one of the most important things a part of this movement is, is relationship building with those on the ground and throughout the South. You know, advances made must include uh, and be led by local actors. You know, we aim to provide the engine for that sort of mobilization, but the leadership has to be at the forefront, it has to be local actors, right? Maintaining these relationships is also important. And for us, uh, in, in creating some sort of sustainable regional advocacy, right? So that's something that we constantly work uh, to, to improve. Then we must ensure that that the information that we share is, is accurate and digestible. Not only the information, <laughs> it has to be something that, that is true, but if, 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 if community cannot take it and be able to, to share that information in their own way, in their own words, then we're not doing a good job in sharing that information, right? So, you know, this allows those organizations on the ground to be up to date with the latest uh, resources to, to more effectively engage with their lawmakers, which is essentially my part of the job for SAC, right? Education on the issues is critical, uh, both for us and our partners, right? So, you know, collaboration is key. Uh, first, we, we, have to, we have to show up. Yeah. But how we show up is important. We always want to make sure that that 
when Sack shows up, Sack is welcomed as a partner. And, and we strive to ensure that we are not the ones who are the face of the efforts again. And I, I like to, to lean heavily on that because, you know, as we've seen fights in the past year in different states, such as Tennessee, um, we want to ensure that if something happens on the ground, Sack mm -hmm. shows up as mm -hmm. the partner that it needs to be. I'm sorry, that's the Alexa hearing me. But um, <laughs> shows up as the partner that it needs to be. And, and, and ensures that we elevate the voices of local actors and local community members. And of course, finally, celebrating the victories from the small to the large ones, like Medicaid expansion in North Carolina. That would not have been possible without the consistently hard work put in by our partners in the state. That's right. So they are truly doing some amazing work. And we as advocates, we as part of this community must be able to elevate their successes as part of the successes as a whole for our, for our movement. Yes, and if I may add, you, they also, along with Southern AIDS Coalition, have taken that work and then started training up and providing capacity building support to other communities to have some of the same wins. And that's what I was going to speak to because we're still in the day of being able to help understand, help people understand um, how important and how critical it is for them to have access to their public policy makers, right? that we want to demystify for people what that system looks like and how it works. And I know the Southern AIDS Coalition does a lot of that, but I know particularly that AIDS United does a lot of that, especially through the sponsorship of your initiatives, including AIDS Watch, right? So, um, so Sati, from your perspective at AIDS United, how important is the role of state level policy in making the landscape of HIV care and prevention in the South? particularly for black communities? What is, what is that, um, how do you all actually locate and, and value the role that state policy plays? So first I'll say that like state work, the way that it's, that I've communicated it just myself is how I see it. So being a younger advocate, I was always worried about well, I don't have access to what's going on in D.C., but I know I have access to my lawmaker because he can touch me. I can see it. I can move. We know that state laws address discrimination. We know that state law, state budgets and allocations are significantly impactful for funding for HIV, um, whatever it may be, from care, support, prevention services, period. We know that state policies influence the accessibility and the authority to this medication. And so that's where the work really happens, right? That's where you can actually transform minds with education and building relationships and maintaining them. And so the, I would say state level work is really important because it's really the vehicle that gets you to DC, that gets you to speaking in front of Congress, that gets you to that place. And so trying to shape the landscape for Black folks, it's the conversations around understanding race and HIV and the other determinants and how they're all interconnected, you can do that really smart at the state level and see those laws being addressed that are particularly directly happening to you right in front of you. You know, I live in Texas, and so I know that Texas is also a difficult state, but like being able to address whether it is medication access or it is around the allocations and budget around Ryan White and my cities perspectively, I have access to those because I can reach out and call decision makers. They're right down the door. And so having the understanding of how important state work is versus in is that I can touch it. I can reach out to it. I can see those policies and regulations be changed right in front of my eyes versus federal level. Yeah. So there's a question, and, and I think it comes directly to you because I'm familiar with the work that you all do. Um, Dr. Jourdain wants to know how to get more involved with influencing policy on a national level and what kind of suggestions you might have. And I think you might have one simple suggestion that's coming up soon. Am I right? So I think how to get involved in a more national level is AIDS Watch. AIDS Watch 2024 is coming up. That is a perfect way to get in front of Congress from respective areas to really influence them. This is where you get to tell your story, but also, you know, make them understand from your perspective of how important HIV care treatment and support is. And so getting involved in just in that per se 
event is important. Now, obviously, there is other options. You know, AIDS, or, uh, AIDS United does have access to a public policy council. You know, that's also where you get entail and also how you're able to shape really your policy work. And through that council, that gives you access to so many different things, but also learning as well, too, from respective states that are around you. And so, yeah, Thank those you. are areas to be able to do it. I'm going to encourage each of you to go ahead and put any contact information, website handles that you want into the chat for particularly for some of these activities and events that you all have coming up. Please share that with uh, our community that's online with us. Um, and, and I'm very grateful um, that you mentioned AIDS Watch is coming up. Interestingly enough, we just had a um, Sister Love and we have another legislative day coming up under the dome, as we say here in Georgia, at our state capitol. Um, but we had a meeting with the women legislators last week. And, uh, and, and it shouldn't surprise or shock me, but it really was one of those moments again when we start just giving out the basic updates and information on HIV incidents, the fact that Georgia's Louisiana might be number three because Georgia's number four. We're always battling somewhere in there um, in terms of new incidences of HIV. And it literally, and I'm saying this because there was a large number of black women in the room when we were giving this data to our legislators, blew some wigs off. I mean, pushed some lace fronts back. They had no idea um, about where we stand in terms of our new HIV incidents. And it they then leaned in to our policy agenda differently because they were learning something that we've known in our community and talk about all the time, but not necessarily in those spaces. So we can't make assumptions about what they know either, especially if we haven't been the ones to bring the information in front of them. So thank you for bringing us all to DC to make sure we get that experience and happening. Morris, share with us, please. A personal story or experience that highlights the importance of advocacy in the Black community and how it's impacted your work at P2P. Because I know you've got some. I, I follow you, dude. I, I see you. Um, so I make videos. That's how I got started. Videos for family, that is, um, <laughs> on um, Facebook. And so... I have to look for your OnlyFans account. <laughs> uh, maybe later. Rent is high. Okay. <laughs> so um, what... My new handle is, I started off like this. Hey, welcome to the story of me living, winning, and thriving with HIV. Yes. And just because I'm talking about HIV does not always mean treatment and or care. Because, I was HIV, because I'm HIV positive, you got to remember, I was HIV negative first. Mm. I say that because I've been living with this, and I'm a, a, I'm a community expert, I guess. They come to me, right? But I remember what it was to be negative, in fact. I was negative before I was positive. So I remember the things I did. I remember, and I think this is, I can tell you a story. I didn't go public with my HIV status for heterosexuals. I ain't even been in front with y'all. I went, I came out with this status because I was black, gay, and I love God. And I knew at, at that point of my, of my life, I thought that God was angry with me because I was a part of the LGBTQ community. I know better now, right? Yeah. And so I said, I need somebody who's black, gay, and who may get HIV to know that God still loves them. Mm -hmm. And not only does he love you, he will sustain you. Mm. Here's the thing. <laughs> I ain't going to preach. The heterosexual said, oh, Morris, I got a son to do this. Oh, I understand now. My cousin is this. My best. It changed, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes what you're going to advocacy for is not what you would be advocacy in. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah for black gay men who love God. I didn't come for the rest of the people. But then I had to center myself. And, and this is where I, I, I say I'm black on purpose and I'm black for real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with that being minded, I can't just look out for black gay men who love God because HIV is human. Mm -hmm. And I start with my own people first and then I go outside, right? Because I don't want nobody, to, I, I don't want anybody to do like me and had 23 pills, right? Yeah. That ain't what I want. <laughs> that ain't, listen, yeah. I would wish that on my, on my worst enemy, and yeah. I don't even like you, right? With that being said, um, that story has resonated with people, and I get real with them. Uh, sometimes we got to go out camera, and, 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 and I, I tell them what a pick line feels like without anesthesia. Mm. I tell you that your skin is your biggest organ because I was scratching so much when I did not take my pills once I did have them. Mm. 
It, it goes back to membership has its privilege. I am a member of this fraternity and sorority of people that live with HIV. And so there are some things that I'm privy to. Yes. That makes this, I don't want you to. And, and should you, I'm going to be here for you. Yeah. That has been the thing that changes. Again, and, and I'm from the South. I was conceived on Campbellton Road. <laughs> right. And if you live in New Orleans, that's the Gentilly. Okay. Gentilly. Right. So I want you to understand. I want to do the comparison. Right. Um, and the other thing is, I am in and of the South. Yeah. I want to say feta, ain't. I want some fried chicken on Sundays and macaroni and cheese. I want collard greens. I want all of those things. Right. And I want to do it with you at the table. Yeah. One of the most important things that I've learned while watching movies is every Black movie has a table scene. And at those table scenes, life changes. Is so I want they say come to the table. No, let's come with some table, bring some food to the table, and then we got something happening. Then you got my attention because you got my tummy. Yeah. And yeah. so I've learned in my personal experience just to be me. And that's enough. Mm. I wouldn't say the same thing for advocates and allies. As I said earlier, you may not be living with it, but if you just bring yourself, I promise you the people are gonna see the rest. They know that this smile is for real, they know when it's sincere. Oh, when I'm faking it. Yes. I'm loving because now I'm 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 serious, y'all. There's there's some stuff to be written about in terms of this cultural capital that uh sort of in that Bob Marley context of who feels it knows it, right? That there's certain things that because I'm of this lived experience, I can say, I can think, I can express, and I can bring you into very yeah. differently from some anybody else who cannot or has not or does not. Um, I I want and and in terms of what you were just saying, that I think uh, attributes itself too to the work of P two P, right? That positive to positive embraces that identity that you just described, so that anyone and everyone who is seeking what they need, you're able to in some ways flex and morph to meet that need in one way or another because you can see and feel it. It's not mm -hmm. like you have a prescribed set of things that are available to people and that's all they get. And, and if they go somewhere else, they gotta go somewhere else, right? Because that's what we get in our communities. If, if I show up as my whole self, but you're only treating me for HIV, but you're not treating me for my violence, for my mental health, for my houselessness, for the other things that are making this HIV harder in my life, then you're missing my whole experience and I'm less likely to stay engaged with you because I'm going to be trying to get these needs met somewhere else. I got it. The rest of my questions for everybody. So we've got about 11 minutes. No, we've got about 14 minutes left. I can't do the math. Sorry, Jamie. Um, but let's talk about the narrative, right? So in what ways has the narrative around HIV and AIDS in black communities changed over time? And what needs to be done to ensure more comprehensive care and support within that narrative? What do we know? Uh, some of that you've just spoken to, Morris, but uh, Sati or Will, if you want to chime in on how the narrative itself um, has changed and or has it in terms of our care and support needs. So I think too, like <laughs> there's this weird narrative that black people do not go to the doctor. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't, you know, we don't know what we need and that we don't access care. But I think that's changed over the course of it is that you can see that black folks do know what they need and we do know how to access it where it used to be done. I think what needs to be done is more accountability for our patient provider experience and understanding that, you know, um, doctors need to also do the work and it shouldn't actually be always on the folks who are accessing care. And so I'm not a person living with HIV. I'm not going to say that I am, but I do know I have suffered firsthand in accessing PrEP is that providers automatically assume they look at my skin. They already see that like, oh, she don't know what she needs. I'm going to tell her what she needs. And so I think that narrative that that to be able to fix that is putting accountability on that provider that, hey, I do know what I need. I'm telling you, let's do this, this is a partnership. This is not you telling me what needs to be done because you are the doctor. Like this is a partnership between you and I as we're doing. And so, That's yeah, right. I think that, that needs to be changed for sure. 
That's right. That's right. Thank you. Will, contribution to this thought. Definitely. I think that um, that one of the narratives that I've seen change and, and also have, that have happened way before I got into this movement and has gradually gotten even better, I think there's been a larger emphasis placed on, on the intersectional nature of HIV with broader systemic issues like poverty, racism, homophobia, reproductive rights, and housing instability, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and, and you know, part of that work is organizations like yours, these on uh, Sister Love and other organizations like Thrive SS, like doing their part in intersectional work that go beyond traditional HIV prevention strategies, right? And, and eventually lead to what I, what I believe have been better outcomes for, for Black communities. You know, today we see the, na the narrative around HIV uh, in Black communities to be one of resilience and activism with, with, a, with a strong focus on, on the social determinants of health, even if sometimes those things are not named, but we, mm -hmm. we name what they are without actually saying this is a social determinant. Um, and these things contribute to, to ending the epidemic in my mind. You know, addressing issues through through health equity and and the social justice lens is becoming mm -hmm. the calling card of of black and, and brown activism in HIV, and and I think that overall this has led to a, a broader understanding of HIV as a complex issue that intersects with various forms of systemic oppression, and that needs to be seen as such. Absolutely, you you hit another nail. On another hand, I think that uh, when when we talk about folks who are doing HIV work, especially those who recognize the intersections and where um, the change movements must coincide and uh, collide and collaborate in a lot of different ways, is that we are dealing with a human rights body of work, that HIV workers working towards change and equity are actually human rights workers, that we're in a human rights movement. And thank you for naming that um, and claiming it in the way that's uniquely ours. And, you know, we're holding this conversation. Uh, and I don't know, I didn't mean to leave you out on the narrative question, Mars, before I go to the next one. You got a comment on that? Real quickly. Yes, ma'am. The narrative that I want to address is that PrEP and PEP are only for the LGBTQIA plus community. If HIV stands for human, <laughs> you're human. Um, and, and real quick, <laughs> real quick, I do not think we uh, are doing enough to, to talk about PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Baby, if you've got to get on PEP, go ahead and get ready for PrEP. I love you down. But mm -hmm. I also need, I need you <laughs> and I need you to survive. And because I need you to survive, I want to make sure that you go from PEP to PrEP immediately, right? Um, living here in New Orleans has taught me what neutral status uh, approach is. And I love it because... I could put everybody in the same room and ain't nobody got to feel ostracized. Yeah. Ain't nobody got to feel different. Yeah. Ain't nobody got to feel like they color purple or somebody else's color red. Yeah. And so for me now, I, my advocacy is changing. My activism is changing. My education is changing because it's, listen, we can get rid of HIV in real life. Yeah. <laughs> and so I see it. I see the end of HIV here. I, I, I want to make it to the mountaintop, <laughs> right? But uh, if I don't, I need people to hear this. Yeah. PrEP and PEP are not just for people living with HIV. Right. If you are a human and you have an extremity or a cavity and you use either one of them, baby, please get on get on PrEP. It's a strategy <laughs> and not a pill. That's, That's right. That's right. I, 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 I want to appreciate you for that. Um, and I also want to name this because this is also the thing that, because we're also talking about assessing uh, how HIV funding and resources have actually uh, impacted our, our outcomes and our work. And, you know, it's usually the folks that have the most toys, that have the most access, that have the most resources, that have the most presence whose word is heard. But check this out. In my organization, you know, we, we just do the work. We don't always have the, uh, didn't, we do now, but we didn't always have the capacity to stop and study what we were doing to then tell everybody else what we were learning about what we were doing while we're still trying to do it, right? Uh, we have gotten some capacity to where we are able to do that now. But 15 plus plus, when, how long has PrEP been out? Even before we had actual um, PrEP approved, what we recognized was talking differently to people who were living with HIV versus people who were not living with, it, with HIV did not help us. 
Because for the women in our work, they're the same women, but for the sake of a moment when HIV made it through, right? So those same lived experiences are changed by an HIV dynamic, but the people themselves are not changed by the dynamics within which they live, right? And so we had created a program called TLC for All, which was testing and linkage to care for all, meaning no matter what your status is, it was also uh, 20, I remember it was 2009, 2010, because we wanted people to get ready for the beautiful universal health care that our upcoming president had promised us, right? And so we wanted to make sure that everybody had access to some pathway of preventive health or treatment, regardless of their HIV uh, testing outcome or their status. And so TLC for all predates status neutrality, but we're happy to embrace it. They, they're welcome to our stage. Anyway, so I wanted to get to this question around Black. Let me just be clear. And, and I know that this is a real, we're serious, but we can't take ourselves too seriously because as Saudi said, this work is hard. Um, and, and it is also about making sure that those who don't want us to survive don't win, right? And so as my best friend Loretta says, fighting hate should be fun. So we we gonna we continue to have fun in this conversation, and as we look to acknowledge and recognize Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, what I want to be very clear about is that um, there's nothing that we don't do as a people in this country that doesn't permeate and affect every other culture, every other social dynamic, every other uh, body of influence. We just our language, our culture, our music, our style, it just permeates, as does the way we address HIV. It has changed the landscape. And I think that that's what's important about this conversation today as we're commemorating the Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, which is tomorrow. Um, and there's also more work that uh, Morehouse is doing, Morehouse School of Medicine is doing around tomorrow as well. But as we look at Black AIDS Awareness Day, what message do you think is crucial for the broader public to understand about the intersections that you've already talked about, race, HIV, and healthcare in the United States? If there was a message that you could either, may not be able to hashtag it, but put it in a you know 30 second TikTok, what would be the message that you think is most important for the broader community to understand about our intersections? I can, I can go first. Thank you, Will. <laughs> I can go ahead, and, go ahead and go first. So um, I think that a message that, 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 that can resonate is that understanding that HIV is a multifaceted and deep, is a multifaceted issue and is deeply rooted in our nation's history and current societal uh, structures. It's, it's not just a health issue, uh, but it's a social issue, a social justice issue, that it cannot be separated from historical and ongoing issues like racial inequality, economic disparity, and systemic uh, discrimination. Um, that, that we as advocates, as activists, as, as people working within the work have to be flexible and innovative in approaches that address the underlying social, economic, and structural issues that we encounter in this work. And, and that we ensure that approaches are, are inclusive, equitable, and effective for all, particularly for communities of color. Yes. I think if everybody just understood that alone, you would not have a shortage in the HIV workforce because people will be coming to help us solve these problems. I really do think so. Um, who's up next? Is that you, Sati? Yeah, I was trying to think of a hashtag. I must, I'm going to kind of use different areas, I think. So I probably would do hashtag we're stronger together because even though Yay. we all are Black folks, we're all different still. And I think that as we are trying to understand the intersectionalities, it's important that we honor different folks inside of our own race as we're doing it because we all are doing this work together. And HIV, like Will said, is very multifaceted. So there's so many different levels, but there's so many people, people in those barriers too, in even those spaces. And so understanding that we're stronger together in our united front, if we don't have our own house in order, mm -hmm. we cannot do what this work, 
We cannot be stronger. We cannot be a united front if we're not even united at all. And so hashtag stronger together. Hashtag we're stronger together. I love it. Thank you so very much. You've given us something to run with. Um, Mars. Hashtag we all we got. Got that one too. At the end of the day, at beginning of the morning and in the middle, we are all we have. Yeah. I said this and I mean this. I think the cure of HIV will come from somebody that's living with HIV. Mm-hmm. Which means we need each other. Mm-hmm. Which means we need to share. We need to have honest conversations about sex. We need to talk about sex. Yes. Um, have honest, honest conversations about our family. Who had kidney disease? Who had heart disease? Understand that HIV is, is, is inflammatory. It's going to affect all that, mm-hmm. right? And so when we have those conversations, then we can move the needle on Black health care. HIV falls in the health care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. So we all we got. <laughs> That's it. I, I got nothing, I nothing, nothing, nothing uh, mind-blowing. We all we got. We all we got. So I'm I'm grateful for that. I should have one more question, but you all have inspired me to just think about this. And Sati, you just said something that matters so much. Same best friend. She's got a bunch of quotes. That's why she's being inducted into the National Women Hall of Fame next month. Um, she says that when people are doing things different, saying things different, um, uh, being different. Uh, well, let me change that. People who are saying the same things, doing the same things. Uh, uh, and thinking the same things and moving in the same direction, what you have there is a cult. But when you have people who are thinking different, moving different, saying it different, uh, and still going in the same direction, that's a movement. And that then sort of solidifies what Will has just said, what Sati has just said, and what Morris has just said. We're stronger together. We're all we got. Um, And what I would say to that, too, is that for those um, for those who are not us uh, and the HIV response from the outside into our communities um, isn't what we all need or want, that's because it's not coming from us. When it comes from us, it works and it changes and it looks very different. Uh, but because of how the world has seen us, that's what I want to say, how the world sees us is also how the world has responded to us in terms of HIV. How we see ourselves is also indicative of how we have responded to HIV. And so I think seeing ourselves as the center of this movement, seeing ourselves as the center of the end of this movement will inspire us to be a part of this movement in a very, very different way. So thank you so very much for all of your comments. We have like one minute left and I've got a big question to ask. And that is looking forward, what are the key steps that need to be taken to effectively address and reduce HIV disparities in black communities, particularly in the South? And maybe you give one or two steps, unless you already have your, you know, Black Panther Party Redux 2024 10-step platform already laid out. What you got? So I'll go first. Um, there, I think building capacity, not just for providers, but the folks, the MA, the people that work the front desk, the folks that are the whole entire piece of it, building that capacity to effectively respond providing that training and ongoing training, because you can give me one training one time, but I need to be refreshed, needs to be updated and more innovative. Most of our interventions are strategies that were built from back in the day. And while that is wonderful and that's great, we need some new innovative. We saw that the pandemic changed really everything for folks and how we do even virtual options. Like I'm here with y'all today. That's so important. And so changing and, and process of our capacity, but also our training mechanisms and how we teach folks. Thank you. Mars. Um, to be inclusive. Uh, include uh, And I, for those of us who understand, I know about doctors and, and I could make my own health decisions or make decisions with my doctor. I also didn't know I could fire my doctor, <laughs> right? And I need you, I need, that is what's gonna help us all. Be inclusive, it's your health. Yes. They are advisors, but it's your health. 
I love it. Be the captain of your own health team. Be captain of your own health ship. I love it. I love it. Will? I think that um, talking on some of the systemic changes that need to happen, I think it's also important to be to bring that up. Um, one above everything, and, and one of the biggest priorities for myself and also SAC is is improving access to healthcare. It's going to be probably the top of that list, and 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 what that incorporates is Medicaid expansion in the South. Some yeah. of the remaining states haven't expanded Medicaid. Are some of them are in the South? That is a priority for us, and and I think it should be a priority for everyone. I think that would make a huge difference in in uh, health outcomes for persons yeah. with HIV and those affected, right? And then yeah. also. Something else that promoting research and data collection among black communities, black and brown communities, to, to better inform us on how to address these issues going forward. And then, of course, something that happens within black communities, but I think it needs to be elevated more so that more people know about it, is strengthening support systems. And that is through mental health services yeah. or, or housing services, uh, reproductive health services. Um, those are the kind of things that are going, re are going to reinforce our communities to allow us to really, really take this fight on. I love these. Thank you all. If we could do so much of this, we could probably reduce the incidents in the shortest amount of time with so much success. I've got uh, my step is center blackness. We are not going to get to the end of this epidemic in the United States, and we're definitely not going to get to the end of the epidemic or the pandemic of HIV in the world if we don't center what HIV means and what it's doing and how we respond to it in black life, period. Um, as we say in the women's community, you know, when you fix it for black women, you fix it for everybody because that is, that's the, that's the anchor that has to be lifted so that um, everybody can ride. Right. Um, and, and if I add on will to what you were saying, I want to expand Medicaid, but I want to do it in the right way. And for those who are in Georgia and don't know that the governor is currently suing <laughs> uh, the president of the United States because he's trying to pass the only Medicaid expansion bill in the country that is attaching work requirements. So they got to expand in the right way. They've got to do it in a way that really still builds on equity, but is also centering on undoing the injustices that have been done to Black people for so long. And that in a lot of ways, because of our own socialization, we have been complicit with knowingly or unknowingly. So we've got to know our laws, know our rights, know what's happening in our state capitals, know what's happening in our local city councils, and know what's happening with our federal decision makers. Um, so pay attention. The Georgia State Legislature is still in, still doing whatever they can to um, undo the rights that have been fought for so long uh, in our state and in our country. So just pay attention. Uh, I'm going to have to bring our part of this conversation to an end. We'll be here for the Q&A. I can't wait for it. Thank you for your comments, for your engagement, for diving in. And especially thank you to our panelists today, Mara Singletary, Sati Nyashwa, Nashwaya, and Will Ramirez. Thank you so very much. Y'all are the best. Y'all are stars. Y'all rock like stars. Thank I'm you, Dezan Diallo. Thank you, Dezan Diallo, for being excellent. And so now I think it's my distinct uh, honor to open this up for questions and uh, discussions, because sometimes we don't always have questions, but we're a part of this conversation, so we want to chime in. Uh, make sure you typed in what you have in your questions. Jamie, do we have people that can do it live, or is it all in the chat box? I'm trying to look and see what we can do here. Okay, so so let me go ahead. Um, yes, please. Uh, Will you are you said there's a comment on Georgia, and would you want to expand on that? Please, by all means, do so. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dizan. So uh, one of the comments in the chat mentioned uh, how we need um, Medicaid expansion in Georgia next. 
Absolutely, right? We do need it here. And your comment stays on about how, what the governor has said. Uh, it's definitely it makes the, the, the fight imperative. But I do want to add some just some contextual information of what's going on, just so that people have a better idea of Thank what's you. happening in Georgia. Yeah, so um, since July, the governor's program has been implemented, the Pathways to Coverage program. They were expected to, to have up to 100,000 enrollees by now. They have about 2,500. Um, what it has demonstrated to the state is that this kind of expansion does not work. In fact, it cost the state a lot of money, which was which has pushed Republican legislators in the state that did not support Medicaid expansion in the beginning now to start talking about it and saying perhaps there's another route to take because it is costing us too much money. But that has also brought on conversations of bringing in something like what they did in Arkansas, which is sort of like a private option. Right. Although, although that's not um necessarily driving the conversation medicaid expansion is more more so uh it is something to pay attention to here in the state and we are now i think i think that we are now this year closer than we were last year to actually expanding medicaid in georgia not happening this session for sure right. but perhaps next session with the advocacy and the activism happening here in georgia and and then some uh some digestion i guess from the legislators uh, into that topic. So I just wanted to, to ensure that I shared that with everyone so everybody has a better knowledge of, of what's going on in Georgia. Thank you for that. And we have a general election, which gives people a chance to change some of the seats at the state level. So we just want to make sure that people continue to be informed of what decisions are moving and what are not. Um, uh, there was a question about advocacy that we talked about earlier. There's another piece of legislation in the state of Georgia that threatens activism and advocacy right on its face, which is to deny cash bail to anyone, almost any criminal activity nowadays. Um, so even for misdemeanors, it's it's a big deal. So we, we encourage people to pay attention to it because criminalization with HIV is still real. Even with our Modernization um, Act that we passed in Georgia, that doesn't mean that the education has trickled into all law enforcement or into the court system. And so we want to make sure we're staying on top of that. Um, I'm scrolling to see if we have uh, other questions. If there are any that I missed, we might want to tap, tap uh, put those on the screen so I can see them more clearly. Um, a lot of people are giving you thank yous. They're saying that this was a great conversation, that, that y'all brought life to it, literally uh, and figuratively. I, I think uh, in the interest of asking questions, because I could have a lot of them, I um, I wanted to ask something because it's been coming up a lot and it's mostly around the science, right? That um, there's a lot of research that's happened. There's a lot going on, especially in HIV prevention, new modalities. What have you seen are the biggest challenges or some of the bigger successes? Because you particularly, Will, were talking about the limited number, the dismal number of people who are most likely to benefit from PrEP in our communities that are not accessing PrEP. Um, what do you think are, are some of those critical challenges to how we are able to translate the science, right? how we're able to take this new news and turn it into real work uh, that or real programs that are effective in our communities. And Julie Patterson chimes in with an additional question around U equals U, which is also a part of that science that has still yet to permeate our communities. Want to hear y'all talk about uh, how you think the science needs to translate differently. Mars, you look like you were ready to jump on that. Uh, Tati, were you ready to jump on that? Yeah, I was going to only say one thing because I know Mars about to say something. So I did you open your I, mic first, so I'm going to go with you, Sati, Mars, and then Will. Okay, so I think uh, when you're talking about U equals U, it scares folks still, especially even folks who are living with HIV, I think. Like every advocate that I've ever in, like, actually had conversations with, they're still difficultly having conversations about just relationships in general. Um, so I think that U equal U has really scared 
folks in the community of having conversations, which is why we don't have a lot of advocacy around it because the science doesn't make sense based off of myths and old misconceptions and education and that. And I think that when we're talking about education, we also don't strengthen our education when we're talking about it. So if you give me some facts, that's great, but you're not encouraging me either. So that basically goes nowhere. It stops right at my face and that's it. And right. so there's not a follow-up to like empowerment. There's not a follow-up to encouragement. And so, yeah. And from my perspective, I feel like U equals U has scared a lot of people still, even in the age and the area where we are in our climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mars. Thank All you right. for that, Tati. I wrote these down so I could not drift away because remember, I'm Baptist. Um, so the first thing I want to address is the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, it is so important that people of color enter mm -hmm. clinical trials. Again, mm -hmm. it is so important that people of color enter clinical trials. And let me tell you why. So we have prep, right? And our prep options are not all are not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the reason they ain't for everybody is because everybody wasn't in the clinical in the clinical trial. It's a little bit both our fault and they fault. Here it is. They were looking at the the um the audience of people who were uh, getting HIV the most, and it was not women. And it certainly wasn't black women at the time. And so guess what was in the, it wasn't in a clinical trial? Black women. That's and right. guess what the aid didn't get approved for? Black women. And Hello. so it took a while, and now we have something. I can't. I don't know if I can say a pharmaceutical or the medicine name, but it's an injectable. Go get your life, okay? Um, and so now let's talk about the science works. I am proof. And if you want to bring humanity to science, here I am. I started, uh, let me tell you, I waited to get tested. Mm. I was your normal black man, don't go see the doctor or anybody in a white coat, other than in the dentist because you want to smile. Right? So, we have to know that the science works because I started with 23 pills and I'm down to one now. It's not, the science works. The love heals. Mm. I'm to say that again, the science works with the people in this square box and the other square box that we was playing earlier, that love heals. This is why I got a little bit of a stomach now. And thank you, New Orleans, for the uh, banana bread pudding. But that's what I need y'all to understand. Okay, that's number one. Now, you equals you, right? And and I heard what you said, Sister Sadie. Uh, I don't know if that's true everywhere, right? And I can only speak again from the LGBTQIA+, plus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We love you equals you. And let me tell you why. Because <laughs> people look at it as a way to have sex willy-nilly and spend from all the all chandeliers in the house. Now, I'm all for you spending from chandeliers, baby. I love it. I, I do. I support you. Right? But I also want you to be informed and, and know that just because you equals you, it doesn't mean syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia ain't lurking. And I didn't, I didn't have, Listen, I, I'm going to be real with you. I had that syphilis shot. It ain't one I want again. I didn't mm. have it as a matter of fact, and I ain't bragging, I'm just telling you my story, mm -hmm. because I want you to see that other stuff is still real. Right. And while I'm doing great with my HIV, I don't want nothing else. Right. Listen, that's it. <laughs> I you. get somebody else to do it. My plate is full. With Thank you. <laughs> okay? So I hear you. does work, I'm proof. There are other people who are undetectable as well. Right? Yeah. So here's the thing. Yes, the science works. You equals you. We can do all of that and we can swing yeah. from chandeliers, but understand what comes along with you equals you. Siblings, yeah. real chlamydia, right? Inner clinical trials. We need you because when we have you, then we know the medicine works for everybody. Amen. So are you, a, before I go to Will, I would ask you very quickly, are you a proponent of DoxyPep? Doxy oh, by all means. I, do I you, am. Do you want to tell us what that is? All right, so to my, I, I know it limitedly, right? So DoxyPep, you take it when you need it. Right now, here's the thing <laughs> in my community, I don't plan to have sex, I'm cute, so it might happen. Right? So, I, I, I don't want to put all of it out there. I am a proponent of doxyprep, it's, it's as a all needed as, as you need it, yeah. do yeah. right. Yeah, it, it took um, this is year 18, it took me 10 years to start taking my pills. Right? Yeah, I'm not a pill yeah. taker, it took me six hours when I had a headache in 10th uh, grade, uh, so it only happened to take 23 in one day. Right? So I understand the pill. I understand pill fatigue. Right? 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, listen, do your body some good. I just think that there that there's just not enough conversation in our community about all of the new science and the new options. And 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 Will, before I get you to give us your the last comment before we close out the Q and A. Um, one of the things that I thought about recently when people ask, somebody asked me, well, of all the populations, if we were going to do this different and better going forward, who who else is left out? Who's left behind? And I'm like, you mean beside the people that have been left out, left behind all this time? Because they still there, right? So black, brown, young, uh, gay, same gender, loving, femme identified, woman identified, po, you name it, these people are still left out of the mix. But if we wanted to really focus in on how to get more folks engaged, it's really about shifting away from the demographic pre identity into the people who don't know or don't believe. Those are the two groups that if we get to knowing more, knowing their status, knowing what's optionally possible, knowing what's available, knowing how to get it, knowing how it gets paid for, knowing who is making decisions about it, knowing, right? So that you can make better decisions for yourself and family and then believing. I just saw somebody put in here, science works down from 23 to one. That's indisputable that that has happened. I know people, you came in 18 years ago. I know people came in 40 years ago and we're at 60 plus pills a day, right? So. The, and, and there are people who are living their daily get raw with it sexual lives with partners living with HIV who are not contracting HIV at all. The science is telling us what's real and people have to believe it, right? And so those who don't know and those who don't believe, that's our population. And that's a lot of us in our community. That's my soapbox. Bro, Will, what you got? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before I even started, I, I really got to appreciate um, the testimonials. Um, I think that that part of the work really moves the work forward more than me pushing out data, me pushing out statistics, me pushing out this policy that just happened. These testimonials really make a difference in people's lives and really tell them the story of why this is important. That's right. I, I really, I really want to uh, focus on, on one of the comics, and that that's on on you equals you, um, and the impact that it, uh, that on uh, the it has an impact on HIV in Black communities. I absolutely think so. the The science, like you said, Dazon, is is undeniable, right? It, it stares at us in the face. This is real, right? Um, I see you equals you as a tool in a toolbox of prevention, and when I look at it like that, when I look at it like that when we are not taking advantage of all our tools in the toolbox of prevention, and this includes PrEP and U equals U, we are failing. And then many times within this movement, I've seen uh, I've seen discussions of, of where one is an advocate for U, U equals U and another person is an advocate for PrEP, and there's there's clashes there. And there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be. Right. The, these tools are used for people, different types of people in different situations, but they all, impact the same outcome, which is HIV prevention, and they should be viewed equally, right, mm -hmm. in the fight, equal partners in this fight against HIV. U equals U last year, for the first time, was recognized by Congress uh, in, at the, at the, in front of the Capitol building in, in D.C., right? And it was, it was backed by Representative uh, Barbara Lee from California. Yes. Showed which is uh, also sad because she, now she's running for the Senate. We're going to lose a champion in the House. But other than that, I think what it demonstrated is that this conversation where it was just happening between us, between advocates and between people within the movement, now is reaching other levels of, mm. of, 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 of distribution, right, mm. these conversations. And we need to continue pushing that. Right. So if we have one representative talking about it in D.C., we need to have our state legislators talking about it as well both about PrEP and both about U equals U as both tools of prevention and this amazing toolbox that we've been able to have now with science and all this, all this advancement. Absolutely. Absolutely. That give, that brings us, and thank you all so very, very much. This is powerful. You all are powerful. 
um, we have the opportunities in front of us. We just have to seize them. We can, we can seize victory. Um, and we will, we will. And I, and I know we will because there are so many others just like y'all who are doing this work to get us there. So thank you so, so very much to everyone who has joined us today for all of your comments and your questions and your engagements. Thank you to Morehouse School of Medicine and the Satcher Health Leadership Institute uh, and today's conversation from awareness to action. You've got lots of calls to action through this conversation. I don't need to delineate them. Um, you've heard them, share them with others. We are not just each one, teach one, everybody teach everybody. Um, I'm just, I think that this is still all hands on even 40 something years in because we're still years from the end. We are in this to end this. I know I am. Thank you so much again, everybody. And I'm now going to turn it over to our dear friend and sister, Dr. Jerry Shroud. Hey, or Jerry Shroud, Stroud. I know she's working on the doctor part. Jerry's welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to this great and awesome panel on today for your transparency, transparency and your testimonies. And especially just for being our champions that are on the ground driving health equity for people living uh, for people living with um, HIV. So thank you so much. This was a terrific and a great discussion. I also want to send a huge uh, shout of appreciation to our partner Gilead Sciences for their support uh, because they have brought to us a, a panel and a safe space where we can have conversations like this, like we just had on today and helping to have a voice to our community. We also want to, uh, as we commemorate National Black HIV Awareness Day, we would like to invite everyone to be our special uh, guest here at Morehouse School of Medicine on tomorrow for our quilt workshop. Um, this quilt workshop is our AIDS Memorial Quilt uh, Workshop, and it shares the stories of every life we have lost to HIV AIDS. This workshop will take place in our atrium area here at Morehouse School of Medicine from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. So please, please, please attend. We want to see your face in the place. Also, please complete the evaluation form. We want to bring you more powerful discussions like this. So we have an evaluation form that we want you to complete and let us know, you know, what did you think about the conversation today? What resonated to you? What things will you take from this conversation today to mobilize your community? We'd like to hear from you. Uh, I hope that something today helped to resonate and to propel you forward as you continue to do your amazing work and ending the HIV epidemic. Thank you for joining us.